Hello, this is Lisa Elwine. Welcome to our series called More Than. More than what? Well, more than what you're seeing may be in the, the plain text of Scripture. There's lots of commandments and instructions that we have as believers that we understand maybe the, the simple commandment, uh, but maybe there's something underpinning that commandment that explains why that's so important. For instance, why is it so important to write the commandments on your doors and on your gates? Well, let's find out. Why is it very important? And the particular uh, commandment that we're dealing with right now is found in Deuteronomy chapter 6, starting with verse 4, and it goes through verse 9. You're familiar with it. Uh, the greatest commandment. Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord is one. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. And these words which I am commanding you today shall be on your heart. And you shall teach them diligently to your children. And shall talk of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, and when you lie down, and when you rise up. And you shall bind them as a sign on your hand, and they shall be as frontals on your forehead. And you shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. And it's the gates that we want to focus on because um, the doorposts, they are called the mezuzah. But uh, often when you see two ideas put together, then you can uh, draw an inference about this particular commandment or this particular piece of information based on the information you're given about the other thing. And so uh, when we look at um, the sha'al in Hebrew or the gate, we see that it's given in contact in context with the mezuzah. The mezuzah. And the mezuzah is the doorpost. It can apply either to the doorpost itself or the little casing uh, that is attached to the doorpost with the commandment in there. Um, but where it says on the doorposts of your house and upon your gates, we can take what we've learned about the mezuzah and then we can apply it over here to the gates. But the gates are typically, you know, a mezuzah will go on a, an individual home, but gates will surround a city. We're talking about a it might even surround a nation, depending on how big the nation is. So we can uh, draw some conclusions about the mezuzah on the gates or the commandments on the gates based on what we understand about the commandments on the doorpost. And so from the mezuzah on the doorpost, this is a uh, modern terminology, again, that's referring to the little casing that goes onto the doorpost, uh, not just the door frame itself. And no one really knows when the practice started, but it was uh, in use at the time of the Qumran community in the first century. It was in use during the second temple period. Uh, so although we don't have a start date on how particular commandments were done, we know that they were practiced in such a way at that time. Uh, and so typically on a, a mezuzah, you're either going to have the, the name of Adonai, one of the names of Adonai, which is El Shaddai, it'll either be spelled out there or it'll be signified by the Hebrew letter Sheen for Shaddai. And then, of course, within the casing, within the mezuzah, is a very tightly rolled piece of parchment made from the skin or the, the hide of a clean animal. And it's been inscribed by someone called a sofer. It's a scribe. Um, and he does this in a particular way, um, primarily, again, to make sure that the text itself maintains its integrity, that nothing is touching another letter that might make you misread it, um, that it's not easy for things to get cut off, letters to get cut off, um, and it's rolled in a particular way. And of course, once you roll it up, um, the word Shema, or here, is going to be on top, and then on the back of the parchment, again, is going to be the Hebrew letter Sheen for El Shaddai. Uh, and Shaddai is an acrostic for Shomer, Dalatot Yisrael, which means the guardian of the gates 
of Israel, or the guardian of the doors of Israel. Um, but the, the integrity of the, te- of the text is, is very important because, because it's prominent on the door. It's not just for the family in this case. It's for anybody passing by. They will look at that mezuzah and they know that that home is distinguished from others. What goes on inside of that home uh, and hopefully what that family does when they go out of the home, there is there are distinct characteristics of that family. And number one is they're going to be obedient to the word. It distinguishes them. Uh, it sets them apart. And so as these passers by walk by, they know who you are. And uh, Moses kind of alluded to this. Um, Deuteronomy 30, 19, he says, so choose life in order that you may live, you and your descendants, by loving the Lord your God, by obeying his voice. And remember, that's what the Shema says. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with your soul, your strength. And the Shema is to listen and to hear. And he says, when you do that, what you're actually doing is you're holding him very close. You're embracing him. And he says, for this is your life and the length of your days, so that you may live in the land which the Lord swore to your fathers, to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, to give them. And we know that that's not just the physical land of Israel. That is also the Garden of Eden that hovers just above it. That's what makes the land of Israel special. It's what can't be seen with the natural eye. Um, but what the mezuzah does, because the root the Hebrew root of it is ziz, which means moving creatures or moving things. Um, it can even refer to reptiles. Um, it distinguishes the covenant family inside the house from the moving things and the creatures outside the house. Um, and um, Again, it distinguishes the family. They don't just put anything in their mouths because they're a covenant family. We know that there's Shabbat meals going on in there. We know that there are feast meals going on in there, that they are observing the feasts inside of there, and therefore they are different from the beasts of the field. Kind of takes you back to the Garden of Eden. They're guarding the doors, and they're asking El Shaddai to also guard their door so that snakes don't slither in there and and bring false doctrines. At any rate, I want to talk about a unique kind of mezuzah uh, that's described in the Torah portion, Ki Tavo. Ki Tavo. And if you say, what what Torah portion? What are you talking about? Well, the the five books of Moses are divided into smaller reading portions for each week of the year. And each of those portions will have a name typically based on the first sentence um, of the the first passage in that particular Torah portion. So Kitavo is when you go in. And you say, well, where is that? Well, it's in Deuteronomy 26.1 through 29.8. Deuteronomy 26.1 through 29.8. So if you want to you know, flip through there and say, what is this Kitavo you're talking about? Then you can have a fuller context uh, for what we're about to discuss about what I'm calling the international mezuzah. If Israelite homes are supposed to have a mezuzah on their doorposts, then it makes sense that not only should the mezuzah be on the gates of the city, but it should also be on the gates of the nation. That the one who is guarding Israel, the one who neither slumbers nor sleeps, there should be some sort of marker out there. There should be some sort of informative declaration that if you cross into this nation, if you come into this country, If you come into the land of Israel, then we are distinct from all other nations. Don't expect to see inside of these borders everything that you see in the other nations. And so because the the mezuzot are often found on important gates in Israel, especially in Jerusalem, if you've ever been there, you've seen these beautiful and sometimes huge mezuzot uh, on the gates of the city. I'm thinking of one in particular that, uh, you know, the the gates of Jerusalem have been shelled over the centuries. You know, it's always had uh, people trying to take it over. And so um, 
one thing that they have done is they have taken these old spent artillery shells, melted them down. Um, you know, the, the pot marks, the chunks are still out of the walls where those, those artillery shells hit the walls of Jerusalem. And they took all that old metal, melted it down, and then made this huge mezuzah out of the melted metal and then used that for a mezuzah on that gate of Jerusalem. So that's pretty clever. Uh, kind of makes you think about how they'll, they'll turn their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. They're taking a weapon of war and saying, hey, we can make it a, a weapon of, of peace. Um, that the one who guards Israel is the one who guards these gates. So the, the title of this particular Torah portion, Kitavo, it means when you come in. When you come in. When you come in where? Well, again, think of the gates of a city. You either come in or you go out of the gates. Um, but there is a very special mezuzah in this particular Torah portion that is going to describe Israel's role, her calling, to be a feast to the nations. And so we say, okay, kitavo, when you come in, when you come into the gates. But there's another Torah portion. And this Torah portion is called kitetse. Kitetse. Kitetse means when you go out. Well, when do you see a mezuzah? When you go out and when you come in, because it's either right there on the door frame or it's right there on the gates. Um, and so uh, the root um, of kitavo, which is bow, you say, well, where else can we find information about this? Where, if we wanted to know something about an international mezuzah, where could we find the very first time this particular verb bow is mentioned, kitavo, when you come in. Well, the first context goes back again to the Garden of Eden. And in fact, when you say bo from kitavo, it can uh, mean either to go out or to come in. So as it's, you have to know the context to know whether you're going out or you're coming in at that point. But the first mention where that verb is used is going to be in Genesis 2.19. Very interesting. It says, I will make a helper suitable for him. Adam's trying to find a wife, and he realized, well, there's no beast out there that corresponds to me. And this helper that Elohim makes for Adam is called Ezer Kenegdo. Ezer Kenegdo. It's basically a helper against him or corresponding to him. Uh, she's there to oppose him if he tries to leave the path of the commandments. And if he's in the commandments, walking in that way, then she's supposed to be a support for him. Um, so it says, Out of the ground, the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every bird of the sky and brought Yavo, you can hear like Tavo, this is Yavo, them, to the man to see what he would call them. And whatever the man called a living creature, that was its name. He knew the essence of every creature. So he was able to call it a giraffe or whatever, <laughs> that it might be in Hebrew. Of course, the, the text is going to be written in Hebrew. Uh, so in this context, we have a helper suitable for him. And then we have the animals being yavo or brought to him to see what he will call them. Um, then in Genesis 2.22, you know, by this time it's dawned on him, none of these animals are going to be suitable. So it says, the Lord God fashioned into a woman the rib which she had taken from the man and brought, um, and the Hebrew word there for brought, just like he brought the animals to Adam, it says, va'yeviha. Uh, Ha. That's another form of it. He brought her to the man. So here's another form of bow, going out and coming in. Right? So she came out of the man, and now she's going back to the man. She was part of him. Now there's a separation, but then what was one has become two, and now it's going to become one again. He's putting it back in unity. He's making it... Um, one flesh. 
And so when we look at the context of Kitabov, that's going to describe this international mezuzah to us, it says, when you enter the land. Well, if we go back to our first understanding of Bo, going out and coming in, he took the woman out of her, then he brought, <laughs> brought her back to him. Um, the first context is in the context of finding a suitable mate. Finding a suitable mate. Because one was taken from the other. And then it's brought back, and they're one again. We also see Adam. He was taken from the Adama. And because of sin, now he's going to go back to the Adama when he dies. His, his flesh, his physical body, will go back to where he came from. Uh, but his physical body, it is said, was formed from the very earth of the Temple Mount, what's called the Temple Mount today. It's been called Mount Moriah. Um, Shalem, if we get back into the time of, uh, say, Noah and Abraham. But the reason that mountain is so special is because it's literally thought to be the birthplace of mankind, where the Adama from that place was formed into Adam or Adam. And then we read, he has to have a suitable mate. It's the idea here, because they're of the same flesh, they were formed from the same dust of the earth. And so when a, when a man departs from the way of Elohim, the spirit is going to oppose him. What will the spirit use to oppose him? The Azer Konegdo. Remember, the Holy Spirit is called um, a comforter, right? And so when that spirit opposes him, it's not so comforting. It lets him know he's departing from the way of the spirit. He's, he's going to feel troubled because in, in that particular instance, she is neged. She is against him. And what he's doing is he's kind of walking to the cursed side of the mountain from the mountain of blessing. But if he will walk in the way, if he will go in, go out and come in the way that he has been commanded, then she's supposed to be a help and a blessing to him. And another word that, or another title of the Holy Spirit is the helper, the helper, the Holy Spirit. And so the Eve, the first woman, is the helper against him. She's a helper when he's walking in the way, when his going out and his coming in are righteous, but when he departs from the way of Elohim, she is supposed to be there to oppose him. So you can see how Eve kind of fell down on the job. Um, she should have been watching over Adam when the serpent came into the garden. It says Adam was with her. Um, things went awry at that point. Um, but as you're, you're looking there at Kitavo and you look at the mountain of blessing and you look at the mountain of cursing, then it, it helps you to realize it's, it's really two choices. There's obedience and there's disobedience. There's blessing in life and there's cursing in death. Deuteronomy 28.6 is going to explain um, the, the unhewn rocks. Remember when they made an altar way back then? They always used unhewn rocks. They weren't supposed to use a tool upon them. Um, and basically, it's kind of saying that this is the word of God and quit hacking on it. Quit trying to shape it in your image. It is what it is, and it cannot be changed. His word does not change. Um, when you see the, the uncut stone destroying the feet, uh, the iron clay, iron and clay feet of the beast in the book of Daniel, it's uncut stone. It's Yeshua. It's Messiah. He's not going to compromise the word. Uh, because sin is basically incompatibility with who we are as believers. Adam needed a, a help mate that was compatible with him, that would be against him when he departed from the way and for him when he was in the way. So in that respect, she was a suitable mate. Uh, this is what the Holy Spirit does. When we're walking in the Spirit, then we sense the life and the blessing and the peace. When we depart 
from the way of Elohim, then we feel the Holy Spirit contending with us, withstanding us, opposing us. Things get really hard at that point. And we're not talking about normal tests and trials. It's like, you know in your spirit you're wrong. And the jeopardy there is the spirit may not always contend with you. There may reach a point where she'll just let you go. Right? So you can, you can learn a lot about the spirit by looking at the relationship between husband and wife. Um, but the idea here in Kitavo is the Israelites are being introduced to a land. Just like Adam came out of the earth, um, there is a compatibility that must exist there from that particular place, from the Temple Mount, from the land of Israel. Mankind, when he lives in that particular place, there has to be a compatibility. And if it, there's no compatibility, then in time he'll be spit out. And that's what we've seen over the centuries. You know, successive kingdoms who have tried to conquer Israel, they'll last for a while and then they get kicked out because there's no compatibility. Um, like a husband and wife, if you're not compatible, you know, things aren't going to go well. Well, the same thing with the land of Israel. If there's no compatibility, then you can't live long in this land, which is what the promise was that Moses made. If, if you will listen to the voice, there will be a compatibility here. And he said, blessed will you be when you come in, and blessed will you be when you go out. Um, and one rab rabbi comments to that. He, he takes it a level higher, not just coming in and, and going out of the city. But he says, may your leaving this world be as blessed as your arrival without intentional sin. And that's kind of the idea behind a mezuzah. It reminds you as you go out, don't sin while you're out there. It reminds you as you come in, don't sin while you're in here. And if, if you'll refrain from sinning when you go out and when you come in, if you will live in compatibility with the land, which means you're preparing to live in compatibility with the Garden of Eden, then blessed will be you when you come in and blessed will you be when you go out. Um, so when you see that mezuzah on the doorpost of someone's home, um, it's customary to touch it and kiss your fingers. It's just a sign of honor for the word of Adonai. It's not a magic uh, talisman. It, it doesn't you know, do magic. It's not for magic spells. It's, it's not for that at all. It's just showing reverence for the word of Adonai that is covering that home. Um, and it's also a gesture of love for the word because, you know, if you touch the mezuzah and you touch your fingers, that's expressing affection even for the word. And it's, it's demonstrating to you that at least for the family that lives in this home, it's a constant companion for them. It's a companion for them when they go out. It's a companion for them when they come in, just like Eve was a companion for Adam. She was compatible, uh, at least until sin entered the world, right? We're not so compatible anymore. We have to work really hard at it. Um, but again, not just a sign to the family. It's a sign to anyone else who could pass by or who might also go out or come in that house. It's, it's kind of saying to the world, this is the word we live by. So we are compatible with this word and are going out and are coming in. And if you expect to come in here, then you should expect to obey the same word. Don't presume to bring your own set of rules to this home. You can come in here to learn. You can come to share. You can come to serve the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob with gladness and joy. But you can't bring the serpent stuff in here. Um, this is the word that rules our home. And um, if that were true, you know, but we, that's why we put the mezuzah on the door to remind us of those times when we depart from that word of our need for repentance. Um, and so if that's important for an individual home, imagine how important it would be for a nation, a covenant nation, to also have some sort of mezuzah that would tell every other nation who they were and what they could bring into that nation and what they couldn't. Because it would have to be compatible with those covenant words, with the commandments of Adonai. But if not, you know, we're still looking at this Torah portion, Kitavo, because it's describing not just the blessings the, for, for living compatibly with the covenant and with the land and with its people. It's also describing the curses that 
that can fall up on you if your behavior is incompatible. Um, Deuteronomy 28, 29, it says, if you don't, because Israel is a special place now, he says, you will grope at noon as the blind man gropes in the darkness, and you will not prosper in your ways, but you shall only be oppressed and robbed continually with none to save you. Well, think about what that's saying. Darkness really shouldn't affect a blind man at noon. Nothing against blind people, love blind people. But he's using this comparison here. He, he could have used any others. Um, but I think this one is easier for us to grasp onto. If we are blind, if we can't see, then what does it matter what time of day it is? Right? So it's talking of the spiritually blind. He's not, it's, it's not about blind people at all. It's about spiritually blind people. Because um, if there were a seeing people in darkness, they could light a torch, and that would help them find their way. In fact, they could assist the blind man. If there were a blind person there, they could light that torch, and it could assist them in lighting the way for that blind person. Um, but it, at this point, he says, you've fallen so far into the curse there's so few lights of the righteous that are available that everybody's going to be groping around at noonday. And it'll be like a blind person groping at noonday. There's nobody to help because they're all blind too. It's kind of like the blind leading the blind. It doesn't matter what time of day it is. You're still blind. You're blind all the time. And so... What happens at that point is the spiritually blind person will cling to others who are as spiritually blind as he is. That's what you do in the dark. You try to find somebody who knows what's happening. Guide me. Lead me. Show me where to go. And at this point, all you have really is the spiritually blind leading the spiritually blind. Another curse, 28-22. It says, The Lord will smite you with consumption and with fever and with inflammation and with fiery heat, and with the sword, and with blight, and with mildew, and they will pursue you until you perish. Wow, that's pretty pointed, especially in 2021. We've been dealing with COVID here for a couple of years, and we have definitely been smitten with consumption, fever, inflammation, fiery heat, the sword, and blight, and mildew. And many have perished. Um, that's, that's serious. That's grave. And it's not saying that as an individual that these people have sinned. We've all sinned and come short of the glory of God. But it's showing us that we've reached a point where an entire nation, in fact, an entire world, is now suffering for the sins of rebellion. What originally applied to Israel has now been expanded to the world. And so the righteous are suffering right alongside the wicked at, at this point. But it, the verse there mentions specific judgments, the pestilence, the sword, and the famine. Um, there's other verses in the context that will talk about wild beasts, which are pursuing. Um, they're, they're enemies of Israel pursuing them. They will destroy personal property. They will consume your children. And so if you add those up, all four of those altar judgments are mentioned in context. The pestilence, the sword, the famine, and the wild beasts. And we've talked about that in the series, The Seven Abominations of the Wicked Lamb. So these things are prophesied, not once, but many times in Scripture. Um, but we have to recognize the source of these judgments. Because who's doing it? Is the devil doing it? If he's doing it, it's because somebody made him do it. Right? We, we always hear, the devil made me do it. I'm like, no, the Holy One makes the devil do it. He still has to obey. Even the demons still have to obey the Holy One. Deuteronomy 28, 28, it says, The Lord will smite you with madness and with blindness and with bewilderment of heart. So whatever tool he uses, okay. If it's politics that is driving you mad, if it's the medical system driving you mad, whatever the system is that's driving you mad, then understand who's pulling those strings. 
the Lord is smiting you in order to bring you to himself. And in fact, that word there for madness, it means not just madness or crazy. It also means fury. Fury. Look how many people in the world right now are angry about something. Um, this is pretty specific because the more we depart from the commandments, the more furious we will become because we don't really make the connection that it's our behavior that's leading to the Lord smiting us. We're not making the connection. Um, and I think in recent times we'd have to agree the rise in dementia is really troubling. You know, younger and younger people are suffering with dementia. And it means that people that should be connected with the covenant are disconnecting from the covenant. And it's evoking this irrational fury in that generation because they've been severed from history. They've been severed from memory. Because if they had history and memory, they could go back to the scriptures. They would understand the source of the dementia. Um, they have forgotten their covenant. Uh, Rabbi Sachs pointed out in that passage there in Deuteronomy 28, the root uh, zakhar is used 21 times in Devarim. And 14 times the Israelites are told not to forget. Well, 14 is the, the number of the generations of Messiah that are listed uh, in the Gospels. But remember, zakhar, he says, remember 21 times. And Rabbi Sachs, he goes on and he comments, he says, there's a difference between history and memory. History is an account of events that occurred sometime else to someone else. Memory, though, is my story. I'm supposed to remember, even if it was in another time period, I can be told to remember something. And so history will answer the question, what happened? But memory answers the question, who am I? Where is my citizenship? He says, we are what we remember. As with an individual suffering with dementia, so with a culture as a whole, the loss of memory is experienced as a loss of identity. We see that today in our culture. Our young people, they don't know who they are anymore. They're, they're ripping and screaming at history, but the problem is not in history. The problem is, who am I? It's my memory. And see, if you uproot the history, then you can uproot the account of where your memories should be drawn from. What are you supposed to do every year at Passover? You have to tell the story of the Exodus from Egypt as if you were there. That's your history. Parts of that history are not good. Parts of that history talk about unfaithful people. Doesn't matter. You keep that history because it will remind you who you are. You won't be able to forget who you are. But again, the, the rise in dementia, the rise in unreasonable anger and, and ripping up of history, both good and bad, that's a sign of a generation that's trying to forget who they are. Or maybe they're just unwitting. Maybe they're allowing certain people to uproot their, their memories of who they are. And this dementia that's afflicting us, it's not because that individual was not righteous. Often they are. Um, the Jewish sages look at this passage and say, wait a minute, these curses demonstrate that an entire nation is being judged because of the rebellion of its individuals. The curse upon somebody who has dementia, it's not evidence that they're a wicked person, but there has been a breakdown in the relationship between the Holy One and Israel. The righteous are suffering because of the wicked. Um, something the Midrash says to this, it says, uh, I don't know, I began to hold the entire community responsible for the conduct of individuals as soon as the Jews crossed the Jordan into Eretz Yisrael and reaccepted the Torah with the curses and the blessings at Mount Gerizim and Mount Eval, which goes back to Kitavo. This is what's happening here. As soon as you come in and you recognize these are the commandments, these are life, departing from them is death. At that point, as you've got the whole nation standing on those mountains, speaking the blessings and the curses back and forth to one another, you're pretty much saying, now we're in it as a nation. 
We're in this together. And if some of us rebel, then all of us will suffer. So if that's correct, then it explains some things to us. We know that um, in another text, it will talk about how, you know, every person dies for their own sin. They do. But sometimes you have to look at a text in Hebrew to find out, is it talking about to an individual or is it talking to, in plural form, to people? So in the, the Torah portion, Bechukotai, in Leviticus, it's addressing in plural form to the people. Uh, whereas in Kitabo, it's addressing them in singular. And what is it saying? The many are going to become one. Just like Adam and Eve, they were one, then they were two, then they were one. With Israel, they're coming back into the land and they're going to be one people. This is kind of a Yom Kippur message that gets inserted into the, the Hebrew month of Elul for preparation. Um, and we have an example. Um, it says that um, the sons of Israel acted unfaithfully in regard to the things under the ban. For Achan, the son of Carmi, uh, the son of Zabdi, the son of Zirah, from the tribe of Judah, took some of the things under the ban. Therefore, the anger of the Lord burned against the sons of Israel. I believe that's Joshua 7, 1. So you see, now as Israel goes into the land of Israel, now they're being judged as a nation because all the sons of Israel suffered the burning of the Holy One's anger. But it's telling us there was just one man who rebelled. So you can see how one person can bring down the wrath upon an entire group. Once you stand there as a group and you make that proclamation, because seriously, if you didn't want to be there on that mountain affirming the blessing and the curse, you could have left. You could have just left. Joshua 7, 11, it says, Israel has sinned, and they have also transgressed my covenant, which I commanded them. And they have even taken some of the things under the ban and have both stolen and deceived. Moreover, they have also put them among their own things. Therefore, the sons of Israel cannot stand before their enemies. They turn their backs before their enemies, for they have become accursed. I will not be with you anymore unless you destroy the things under the ban from your midst. So whether we like it or not, whether we agree with it or not, whether we live like it or not, standing in the covenant is standing as one nation. Our identity as an individual is really outside of the land. Um, but I believe at this point in history, as we've gone through these um, cycles of the sevens, what we see is what used to uniquely apply to Israel, that's being expanded. Now where all the nations are going to have to come up and worship at Sukkot. It's not just Israel, all the nations. Well, we can see these judgments that are, that are given in Joshua where one person transgressed the covenant. Now everybody's going to suffer. If it's the footsteps of Messiah, then it's highly likely that it only takes a few rebels in order for everybody to suffer, but there really, there, there's no division between yourself and every other Israelite. If there is a division that exists, it's only in your head. You're not an island unto yourself. You are standing with a nation. That's what happens at Yom Kippur. You stand as an individual at the Feast of Trumpets, but you will stand with a nation for judgment at Yom Kippur. And what you don't want is to hear, I will not be with you anymore. Wow, that would be heavy. So let's look at Israel's national mezuzah. Uh, Deuteronomy 27, verse 1, it says, Then Moses and the elders of Israel charged the people, saying, Keep all the commandments which I command you today. So it shall be on the day when you cross the Jordan to the land which the Lord your God gives you, that you shall set up for yourself large stones. Those large stones in Hebrew are avanim, Dolot, avanim dolot, and coat them with lime and write on them all the words of this law. When you cross over, 
so that you may enter the land which the Lord your God gives you, a land flowing with milk and honey, as the Lord your God of your, as the Lord the God of your fathers promised you. So what is he saying here? Um, I want you to set up large stones. I want you to put like a lion plaster on them so that you can write on them. And he says, I want you to write all the words of the law on these stones. So as you're coming over the Jordan, the Jordan is going to be a separation point. Jordan is the official entrance into Israel. It's not that Moses never went into the promised land. He did. They were all down in the southern part of it. Um, but the official entrance is not until you cross the Jordan. Um, if, if you've not had a chance to look at our, our book, 50,000 Degrees in Cloudy, A Better Resurrection, it explains the importance of the Jordan to the plan of redemption and resurrection and crossing back into the garden. It has its own story. But this is why it's the official entrance. You need to cross the Jordan. So even though they had been wandering around in the southern part of Israel for 40 years, they needed to come through the door. Remember Yeshua said, if you come in any other way than through the door, you're a thief and a robber. There's maybe a little tongue in cheek there. But they're entering in to the land of Israel across the Jordan. Remember the waters piled up so they could go over on dry land? That's exactly what happened when they left Egypt. The waters of the Reed Sea were rolled back and they walked through on dry land. Um, but in this case, he's saying now you're going in as a nation, you're going back into the land, you're going back into your inheritance. Um, these are the commandments I'm going to require of you to keep, keep all of them, and write them on big rocks. I've been to Little Rock, I don't know if I've ever been to Big Rock, but they needed to do that. Um, why do they need this international mezuzah to enter into the land? It has to be more than just kitavo when you go in that's meeting our natural eyes at this point. But if we remember that the Garden of Eden hovers just above the land of Israel, um, it explains why. Because we might expect to see rocks and dust. We, if we go there and we just look at the natural land, that's all we see. But it's only with spiritual eyes that you're going to see what's, what's in this realm just above it. And by putting this international mezuzah there at the doorway to Israel, they're reminding themselves inside the house, and they're reminding the nations outside the house of their ultimate goal. They were called to be a light to the nations. They were called to guide the way back home with the light and the lamp of the word because every human being was born out of the temple mount. They're the dust of our bodies. The Israel became the, the vehicle, the messenger, for the message because it was going to be through them that the nations would understand their need to return to the, the original obedience intended in their creation. Um, it's obedience to the word that's going to open the door to blind eyes, right? And so if we look at history, um, You've got the, the kings, the wicked kings of Sodom and Gomorrah, who before the ultimate destruction, they fell into the tar pits. Uh, if you look at the builders of Babel, um, they got confused with their language, and that split them up. Um, the men of Sodom, who wanted to molest the angels in a, in a beastly way, and they were blinded where they couldn't find the door. Each of these is some aspect of being blinded and confused of doing something that's just mad and furious. Uh, look how angry the sodomites were, that they couldn't have what they wanted. They go around and around a house all night and they can't find the door. Exactly, that's what it's talking about. It's a supernatural blindness. It's obedience that opens a door to the holy places. And when you open that door to the holy places, it's going to lead you back to a sapphire pavement and that sapphire pavement are those beautiful commandments that are emanating from the throne down into the Garden of Eden. 
Remember it says a river flowed out of Eden and watered the whole garden? Well, there was a, a lower garden, the Garden of Eden. There was an upper garden where the throne is. And the water came down from that upper throne, and that's what supplied the, the living water that was Yeshua, by the way. He says, I'm the source of the living water. Um, as one goes, so goes the other. And now you can see why fallen, sinful human beings can't see that realm. They've been blinded from it. Um, and so Yeshua came to die to prepare us again to be able to cross through the door. He says, I am the door. You have to come in through me because if you try to get in another way, it'll burn you up or it'll flood you. But he says, if you'll follow me, you'll walk through the fire. You won't be burned. You'll walk through the water. You won't be drowned. I'm your way back in. But... Before you go in, I believe you have to accept the international mezuzah. The commandments are written there, and you have to say, yes, okay, I will. You can't say, well, I'll just make up the ones um, that sound good and ethical to me. I'll pick the ones I like. No. As you pass that international mezuzah, as you're going into the gates of the nation, you have to give obedience uh, a promise of obedience or just won't last in the garden. Um, Genesis 13, 10, it says, Lot lifted up his eyes and saw all the valley of the Jordan, that it was well watered everywhere. This was before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah, like the garden of the Lord. Right? So it's showing you, it's, it's, it's giving you a glimpse because it says Lot lifted up his eyes. He saw something that he couldn't see with his natural eye. And what he could see is this area around the Jordan was like the Garden of Eden. You could see the river that's descending there, Urad. It means to come down. That's Jordan is Urad. Um, so even though you can't see this realm, you have to know spiritually that it's just above there. Because you can't see it doesn't mean it's not there. In fact, this realm is thought to be no higher than the height a dove would fly and no higher than the, the height of a balsam tree. Where do we get that? 2 Samuel 5, 23 through verse 24, 1 Chronicles 14, 14 through 15. This is the tops of the balsam, where the, the army of Adonai, they're marching in the tops of the balsam trees. Those, there's armies are moving back and forth there. And I've stood next to a balsam tree before, and I was about the same height, and I'm 5'5". Five five. So a balsam tree is not very high. That explains why sometimes the kingdom is spoken of as something you, you go up into, but it's also something you enter into. You just walk into it. You're not supposed to think of it in terms of natural space, but in terms of spiritual space and realms. Um, sometimes the chariots of Israel, think of Elijah, they were seen in the mountains. Um, and these were supposed to represent um, symbolically Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, who believed in the resurrection. And these are kind of the, the vehicles. These are chariots. Um, what did the servant say? Oh, my father, my father, the, the, the chariots of Israel and its horsemen. Who are the chariots of Israel? It's those, those uh, transporters, so to speak, that can take us from the natural to that spiritual realm upon our death. We can cross the river back into the garden. Um, and the understanding is we think of the natural rivers of Eden with natural water, but there are also spiritual rivers of Eden that correspond to them. And so you've got the Pishon, the Gihon, the Chidekel, or the Tigris. And finally, you've got the Parat River, which is also called the Euphrates. But the definition of a river in Hebrew is something burning and shining. So in order to cross the Yarden River, the Israelites were going to need divine assistance. And what do they do? They erect these, these enormous stones. They make these enormous mezuzot. They write the commandments on them. And then what happens? This Jordan River miraculously starts flowing backward until they cross. And that's the whole message. 
The rivers of Eden cannot be crossed without divine assistance. You don't do that all by yourself. You need the resurrection power of Yeshua at that time, the same as you did to cross the Reed Sea. And this is why you tell the story of Exodus as though it happened to you. You did cross the Reed Sea. And so you will cross the Jordan. Um, but you have to guard your going out and your coming in. Um, there is, you know, um, often confusion. When people try to enter into that holy space unworthily, out of pride, out of jealousy, out of wanting to lift their commandments above the commandments of God. And so we can um, kind of go back to the first mention with the Jordan River, which is Yarden. The, the root of it is Yarat, which means to come down. We'll look for the first mention of this root. That's Genesis 11, verse 3. This Tower of Babel. They said to one another, Come, let us make bricks, Yobanah, and burn them thoroughly. And they used bricks for stone. They used brick, Levana, for stone, Aven. Remember when you made the international mezuzah, you made it out of Evnim Dolot. It's big stones. Okay, they were substituting man-made bricks for stones. And they used tar for mortar. They said, come, let us build for ourselves a city and a tower whose top will reach into heaven. And let us make for ourselves a name. Otherwise, we will be scattered abroad over the whole face of the earth. And the Lord came down. Remember Yerad? The Yarden, the Lord came down. One, to see the city. And two, to see the tower which the sons of men had built. And then what happens? They start babbling. Their language gets confused. They start talking, but they're all confused. And this is what happens. Because remember, when they crossed the Sea of Reeds, there had to be silence. When you cross the Yarden, there has to be silence. You have to contemplate the Yeshua, the salvation of Adonai. And so what mankind is doing here is rebelling. They're preemptively trying to build a city that will take the place of Jerusalem. Jerusalem is how we connect back to the Holy One, how we unite with Him. Instead, they think that their structure is going to be some kind of temple reaching into heaven. That somehow it's going to draw down this power, and through it they're going to reunite mankind with the Garden of Eden and the presence of Adonai, but he will not draw near to rebellion. He will not draw near to your way of doing things. So rather than wait for Yeshua, rather than wait for the plan to be, you know, roll out through history, rather than wait for Eden to descend at the proper time, just like you see in, in the book of Revelation, there is an appointed time, there is a appointed place of redemption. Instead, they try to circumvent that, and now they want to make their own name in the earth. And they're even trying to reproduce the, the brickwork that would connect them with the throne. The Where do we get that? Exodus 24.10. It says, and this is when the elders are eating and drinking on Mount Sinai. After the receiving of the Ten Commandments, it says, They saw the God of Israel, and under his feet... There appeared to be a pavement, a livnat, of sapphire, as clear as the sky itself. Well, the first set of tablets were thought to be made of sapphire. But what do they see? From the throne, from his feet, there's a pavement, a livnat. It's a brickwork. But this brickwork is of sapphire, as clear as the sky itself. It's clearly truth. It's clearly commandments for man, if man wants to reach God. Adonai, if mankind wants to reach the throne, you walk on this pavement. You walk on this brickwork of sapphire. You walk on these commandments. This is the way. Walk in it. But instead, at Babel or Babylon, what do they do? They start trying to make these brickworks to reach up into the heavens to do it all by themselves. They don't want to accept the commandments. Instead, they want to make them and to penetrate back into the Garden of Eden wrongfully. Um, 
In fact, as you, you read the description of how they burned the brick, it's actually one singular, it's kind of strange, but it's an intensive of seraph, how they burned it, seraph. Well, that comes from the same root as seraphim, which are the burning angels. And then they would break out on you as biting serpents in the wilderness too. But it shows you how they're trying to mimic the way of righteousness. Um, even the tar or the mortar that they're talking about, it's used to describe the slime pits of Sodom and Gomorrah, where Lot thought he saw the garden of the Lord. Well, he probably did. It's just that his natural eye refused to see the slime pits of human self-will. So the Tower of Babel united mankind in idolatry and self-worship. They said, we'll make for ourselves. Well, you can't make it for yourself. Yeshua makes it. <laughs> Yeah, the, the father will provide for himself a lamb and a ram. So it was a, an attempted forced entry, uh, a kind of a battle with heaven to re-enter, which would have reintroduced sin back into the garden. And the punishment, it was difficulty and confusion. They couldn't understand. So by putting these big stones at the door to the promised land, there at the Jordan, Israel is warning the nations outside as well as themselves inside that you are entering into a special place. Don't come in here with the idea of introducing your own ideas about commandments or what it means to connect with Adonai. When you do that, it comes with a price because if Adonai decides to come down and take a look, you can be thrown into madness and confusion. The price of entering into this place, when you see that international mezuzah, is to obey the commandments. It's a preparatory work. And the commandments have to be obeyed when you go out to work and when you come in the house. You have to walk along that sapphire brick road of the Yarden. And if you do so, he says, blessed shall you be when you come in and blessed shall you be when you go out. These stones are right there to witness as a national mezuzah. And they're set up outside the land at the doorway. That gives them a special significance to the nations. Israel has the mezuzot on their own homes. But this international mezuzah, that's a sign to the other nations. And the Midrash says that those stones were inscribed with the commandments in the 70 languages of the nations so that they could learn it. Even though they had refused it, it's thought that the, the Torah, the Ten Commandments, went around to the whole world at Mount Sinai. But Israel was the only entire nation that said, we will do and we will hear. Out of the other nations, there was only a remnant, they said. And so now they're setting this international mezuzah up so that the other nations can learn it. That remnant among the nations, if they want to, they can come copy it. They can come into that covenant if that, that seems good to them. If they want to cross the yard and into this holy place. Um, but at least afterward, they said there would be no nation that could pretend that they weren't warned. Not just about the special qualities of the land and the people of Israel, but that they were not warned about the commandments of the Holy One. And so the seven nations who were already there, who inhabited Israel, the Midrash says, they were also thus warned with these stones. It's just like a, a decree in stone. And they could have been permitted to stay in the land as a protected class of strangers if they'd repented. They would not repent, so they were to be annihilated. It says in the Midrash that the Gentiles sent scribes to copy the Torah from the stones, but there was not one nation that improved their deeds, even though they had a copy of it. Think of how many nations today have Bibles, tons of Bibles, but it's not improving deeds. They say the tradition of the great stones bearing the Torah in 70 languages, again, is linked to Mount Sinai, where it was thought the nations as a whole nation were rejecting. Um, even though it was given to them in their own tongue. 
that takes you back to Acts chapter 2. You've got the nations coming in, the proselytes from the nations, those who would be interested in the international mezuzah and doing what was written on it. And what were they given? They were shown through those tongues how, what it meant to come back, uh, what it meant to be welcomed into the doorway of the house of Elohim. And so they could take those commandments now, and now they could be like little movable rocks going back out to those nations to preach those commandments. But ultimately, as, as many good things as there were written on those stones, ultimately those stones informed the Gentile nations that God's anger was kindled as a result of their idol worship and abominations, and that there would eventually be a reckoning for idol worship. And then what happens is Joshua takes the 12 stones that were there at the Yarden, and he takes them over to Mount Ebal, where the, they're going to split up and, and speak the blessings and the cursings for obeying or disobeying the commandments. And the Jordan would have been at its highest crest, because it's the month of Nisan, it's the winter rainy season, all the snows are melting from Lebanon and the, the Golan Heights. So it's virtually impossible to cross without divine help to dry up the way. But they say Joshua also erected 12 stones in the Yarden. That's from Joshua 4.9, where the Israelites crossed. It says Joshua set up 12 stones in the middle of the Jordan at the place where the feet of the priests who carried the Ark of the Covenant were standing, and they are there to this day. You say, what's going on here? The Talmud explains a little bit of it. It says each stone could be carried by a single representative of the tribe. The entire congregation accompanied them to Mount Gerizim, where Joshua erected a stone altar for a national feast and rejoicing. They inscribed the Torah on the stones of the altar in all 70 primary languages, dismantled the altar, and brought them to Gilgal, where Joshua erected them as a monument in one day. This is in addition to the 12 stones placed in the Yarden. And then in Joshua 4.24, Joshua says, so that all the peoples of the earth would know the hand of Adonai, that it is mighty. This explains why there's so much rock moving at the point that they, they cross the Jordan, that there's these rocks from the 12 tribes that were set in the middle of the Jordan, not just the international mezuzah, but the rocks that would be there as a witness when those tribes returned. And in our, one of our online classes, I had a student who threw in here uh, Matthew 3, verse six, verses 6 through 9, says uh, people were being baptized of him in the Jordan, confessing their sins. But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees come to his baptism, he said to them, O generation of vipers, who's warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Bring forth those fruits proper for repentance, and think not to say within yourselves, We have Abraham to our father. For I say unto you that God is able of these stones to raise up children unto Abraham. You see why Joshua would put the stones in the middle of the Jordan? When the tribes come home, he's going to raise up children to Abraham who can cross in there. But he says, you're not going to do it without repentance. You're not going to make up your own rules. You do have to repent if you want to cross the Jordan. And three times in this, this portion, Moses describes the land of Israel as a land flowing with milk and honey. And as it turns out, milk, honey, wine, and balsam were thought to flow through those four rivers of Eden. And each product represents something restorative to the creation. And it speaks of the life and those many blessings that were pronounced uh, for obedience to the word. And so, uh, they say the milk and the honey, which is probably mentioned most frequently, they say the milk represents the milk of clean animals, that the animal world there will no longer be under the curse, and our kinship with the animal kingdom is restored. Honey, they say the sweetness of the plant world, which will bear seed, um, and that seed being the word, 
the wine, they say the joy of holiness that restores the soul and our speaking fellowship with Elohim. They refer to Deuteronomy, uh, excuse me, Genesis 35, 14, where it says Jacob set up a stone pillar to mark the place where God had spoken to him. And then he poured wine over it as an offering to God and anointed the pillar with olive oil. And Jacob named the place Bethel, which means house of God. Uh, and so the wine offering on the stone was to mark the fact that God actually spoke to him. And then he says, it also represents the wine serving with joy and gladness because Deuteronomy 28, 47 says, bad things will come because you did not serve the Lord, your God with joy and a glad heart for the abundance of all things. So it represents joy and gladness in service. Sometimes we get worn down with ministry. We get worn down with, with keeping the commandments and being kind and being all the things that he wants us to be for other people and to other people. We just get worn out. And it kind of takes away the gladness. But he says, hang in there because there is a place prepared for you where you will never lose the joy and the glad heart. And then there's balsam. Um, this is found in 2 Samuel 5, 23 through 24, 1 Chronicles 14, 14, 15. Balsam is said to uh, represent the scent of good deeds clinging to Israel. And also those balsam treetops where the armies of, of God, it says, are marching around the grounds. Uh, kind of protecting and patrolling there, but the, the odor there of the good deeds. So this is all good news, right? The good news is there's an international mezuzah out there. And the good news at this point is we're not playing catch up. We're already aware of the commandments of Adonai. We've got the mezuzah on our doorpost, and we're all looking forward to the day when we cross over the Jordan and we go over and we see those 12 stones that were placed there by the 12 tribes. And we can see exactly how he has raised up children to Abraham. Because these are the children of repentance who are prepared to go in past that international business.